that's all the music you know and love. Like, all of it. Gone. I'd already thought about this question for quite a bit when I flip-flopped. Um... I'd probably never be able to do That's a great question. Would you rather? A classic game played on road trips and hikes and dates and corporate board meetings. I like philosophy and I like music. So my question today is this. Would you rather never be able to listen to music from the past again or never be able to listen to music from the future starting now? Let's see what Adam has to say. Um, hmm, that's an interesting question. Uh, old music always lives in here, if that makes any sense. Um, I'd probably never be able... Hmm, that's a great question. I, I'd want to... <laughs> huh. It's a bad question because I don't want to not listen to either, if that makes any sense. Both are kind of ter uh, torturous, but... Um, I'll say... I'll say never be able to listen to new music. It's a hard one, though. Andy from the less distant past here. Adam might have interpreted my question a little bit differently than I intended because I used the words new and old music instead of future and past music. However, if he did interpret it that way, it's just as interesting of a question as what I originally intended, and I'm still gonna address it in this video because it's actually well worth discussing. So that'll be at the end, but keep that in mind. Just wanted to say that. There's a couple of interesting things going on psychologically here. First, I want to clarify some minutia. Everyone else is unaffected. You're the only one this happens to, and you do get to keep your memories. Now, there is the question of if you are a musician and you make music, and then you pick past, you could make music yourself so long as you never release it. Because if you picked past and then you make something and eventually release it, then its release date would be in the future relative to when you made the decision. So you wouldn't be able to listen to that. So you could make music, just you would never be able to release it. Now this brings up the point, can you find a loophole here where you just listen to unreleased music? And yeah, yeah, I guess you could. <laughs> um, but you could also do that for past music. You could also find unreleased music from the past if you picked the future option and listen to that. So it goes either way. What you have to know though is that that's just not gonna be a very efficient way of consuming music. Most music that we listen to is released. As for those psychological effects I mentioned earlier, there's two that I wanna look at. There are more, I'm sure. But I wanna talk about the tangibility of loss and FOMO. First, the tangibility of loss. The tangibility of losing all future music is not really there. You don't know what you're losing. However, if you are going to lose all the past music, right, by picking the future option, you lose all the music from the past, that's all the music you know and love. Like, all of it. Gone. That loss is very tangible. You can imagine what you're losing in that case. You can't imagine so well what you're losing if you lose the future. So the tangibility of loss is going to bias you towards picking the past. FOMO, on the other hand, will do the opposite. FOMO is gonna bias you towards the future because maybe your favorite artist will release their greatest album ever in five years, you don't know. And you're gonna miss out on that. That's kind of scary too. Obviously, neither of these options is great. You're losing stuff in both. Both are kind of torturous, but... It's an interesting question. Now, more so than your sensitivity to FOMO or how tangible loss affects you, I think that the most important factor is going to be your age, how old you are. Imagine that you are on your deathbed. You're at the end of your life. And I ask you this question. It's pretty obvious that you're going to pick the past because there's just nothing for you in the future. You don't have much future left and all the songs that mean something to you are going to be in your past. So of course, you're gonna pick the past at the end of your life. So if it's trivial that you would pick past at the end of your life and it's questionable when you're earlier in your life like me, then it seems like the trend is the older you are, the more likely it is you pick the past. And indeed, I saw this trend when I asked people on my Discord server about this. I didn't have an enormous sample size, but the younger people were, the more likely they were to pick 
the future, the older they were, the more likely they were to pick the past. And it makes a lot of sense. Now, for me personally, I would actually pick the past. This is different from what I said at the time that I asked Adam Neely this question. So, Undervania, some of you might know Undervania who are watching, um, he makes cool electronic experimental stuff, I'll link him in the description. He also asked a question on that Q&A livestream that got answered by Adam Neely. Uh, and we were talking just after I um, asked my question, and I told Undervania that I would pick the future. I told him that I'd pick the future, and I gave some interesting reasoning, which I think is still worth discussing, but it goes to show you can flip-flop on this question even when you've thought about it for a while, um, and I think that's why it's a cool question. So what I talked to Undervania about is the fact that new music and current music will encode past music. If you watched my last video, it was all about how you know music is built on copying. Copying is the creative core of music, right? And because of that, you aren't really losing as much information as it maybe seems at first if you pick the future because future music and current music encodes old music. It contains old music in some sense because new composers are inspired by old composers. They copy old composers, they learn from old composers. Something to consider. Now, I still would go with the past and that's because of mainly a few songs that have really important personal meanings to me with relationships that I have with other people that are tied with those songs and I just couldn't imagine not being able to listen to those songs again um, because of the uh, relationships and the emotional meanings of those songs for me. And of course, my teenage years are past and that's where you get the most nostalgic music from so I think I'd go with the past, but I flip-flopped on it and I'd already thought about this question for quite a bit when I flip-flopped. Now, if you've watched this channel much before, you know that I like to generalize and abstract things. So we're gonna do that here. If you picked past, I'm gonna make this question really difficult for you. You ready? How far back would you have to move the split point before your decision flips? Okay, here's the generalization we're making here. So far, we've just been talking about the future versus the past. And one way to generalize that and conceptualize it is a partitioning of all of time, where you have a split point around which the partition happens and you get two parts. So we've been talking about the split point being now, but we could think about the split point being else when. Else when? Yeah, else when. It is trivial that if the split point was, say, 20,000 years ago, then you would pick the future, or the latter partition, the future relative to then. But you're picking past now, so it must flip somewhere. It could even flip multiple times. You could formulate something where that happens, but probably it just flips once. Where? Where does it flip? So I'm forcing this question to be difficult because I'm asking you, where is this tipping point? Where is the point at which either side of this point in time has equally valuable musical content for you? If you picked future, this question doesn't work so well because then we're asking about how far forward would you move the split point before you would change your decision to pick past but we can't really meaningfully answer that because we don't know what the future of music will be like, especially more than a decade in the future. So that's not as fun, but if you picked future, you're not done yet. Up until now, we've been discussing a static partitioning of time, where there is one point in time and everything after that is what you can listen to, or everything before that is everything you can listen to. But. What if the partition was dynamic? I think this might have been what Adam was actually thinking because I used the words new and old, not future and past. So maybe what he was thinking and what I'm gonna talk about now is a moving window that defines new music versus old music. Say 10 years as an example. Seems kind of reasonable, I guess. So the last 10 years would be new music and everything before that would be old music. The question is, as that window moves with you through life, would you want to only be able to listen to music inside of that window or only be able to listen to music before that window? I'll say never be able to listen to new music. 
And I think I would do that too if new music meant the last 10 years. But what if it was 100 years? What if the last 100 years is new music? Well, that becomes more difficult for me. And maybe you can see where this is going. How big would you have to make the definition of new music in order for you to actually pick new music? Because again, we've got obvious decisions on either end of this. If new music means in the last minute, within the last minute the song had to be released for it to be considered new music, well obviously you're gonna pick old music. Maybe you can't attend like a live premiere of a song, but because of time zones maybe even that's okay. I don't know. The answer is obvious. You would go with old music if new meant the last minute. But if new meant the last 10,000 years, well then it's obvious that you would go with new music. This pattern is kind of a way of generating difficult questions. It's kind of a rhetorical sleight of hand because I'm asking you, okay, here the decision is obvious, here the decision is obvious but different, where does your decision flip? And then I can take that question and put it back onto you with that flip point and say, what is it now? And you've done all the work to make it difficult. And really another way of phrasing the question, where is the flip point is, where is the decision most difficult? <laughs> where is it most a toss up? And you could apply this to a lot of other things. You could partition other things and ask, you know, where the flip point is, or let's partition it here. Which one would I choose? Favorite artists, for instance. It doesn't have to be a continuous range like time. It could be a discrete range like artists, favorite artists. List them in order of your favorites. How many of your top favorite artists would you be able to go with and have no one else? I think the point of this video, maybe, is that these kind of partitioning questions are interesting and they can make you think in new ways about the stuff that you're partitioning, like time and music, but they can also kill time. So, you know, next time you're on a road trip, think about your partitioning of favorite artists and where the flip point would be in that. Now, of course, the real reason I made this video is to brag that Adam answered my question in a live stream. But I also wanted to quickly acknowledge that it was a live stream. He was trying to move things along. I'm not trying to throw shade at Adam. I think you all know this, but I just wanted to say that. Like, I'm not trying to throw shade at Adam saying, like, I stumped him. He's done. Like, okay, we good? We good. Thanks for watching. See you next time.